No Jack. And it addressed a number of diseases uh, that have shown benefit with JAK inhibition, including vitiligo, alopecia areata, and idiopathic itch. And we kind of think that those, were, th those have been pretty well ironed out at this point. We know that JAKs are effective through a number of case reports and case series and, and even larger studies. But the point this year is really uh, to move on to, to new diseases. Here I just want to show you what we talked about last year. We started with uh, Paul Changelian, who will be talking to us today as well. Um, just kind of outlining uh, what JAKs are and how they work. John Jacobson talked to, us, talked to us about how to try to improve JAK inhibitors, uh, improve their targeting and, and efficacy. I talked about the efficacy of JAK inhibitors in vitiligo. Brian Kim talked about itch, and Julian McKay Wigan about hair. And Vijendra Nalamothu um, um, talked about uh, developing topical JAK inhibitors with all really interesting titles. So this year, we'll, this is uh, Jack Be Nimble. Again, we're talking about uh, developing Jack inhibitors for a new panel of diseases. Paul will again talk about what Jacks are uh, through Jack Inhibitors 101. We appreciate that to get us all caught up. And then we'll, uh, we have some invited abstracts that were submitted. Uh, and this includes dermatomyositis, morphia, cutaneous lupus, uh, the, the role of Jack signaling in viral versus microbial infection, melanoma and, and UV melanoma genesis, um, in promoting hair growth, but not necessarily through inhibiting uh, autoimmunity and alopecia areata, but just by stimulating antigen. Uh, atopic dermatitis, I have been told, is, will not be discussed today. And then lichen planopilaris, which is a new inflammatory hair disease. Um, so, so that's what we're going to hear from. I'm not going to take too much time. But just to remind everybody, this is, this is the, the progression of Jack Symposia that we've had. So last year we had You Don't Know Jack. Uh, great names. I love these names. I'm not sure, Stu, who's, who selected these names, but they're creative. So 2017, You Don't Know Jack. 2018, this year, Jack Be Nimble. And I would just like to suggest, uh, I actually have no role in picking the titles or the speakers, but I'd like to suggest maybe next year we, we um, throw a bone to my, my uh, favorite comedian, um, Chris Farley, and talk about uh, some drugs don't amount to Jack. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see if that flies next year. So I'd like to introduce Paul Changelian uh, to tell us about JAX 101, uh, catch us all up so that we can uh, start to think about how JAX work and where they might be more effective. Thank you. Oh. And just a reminder to all the speakers, please stay to your time uh, because we have a lot of people to get through and only a limited number of minutes. Uh, we can't extend that. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, so uh, let's see, next slide. Uh, I'm an employee of Eclaris, so that's my disclosure. Um, as John mentioned, I'm going to go through some of the history. Um, I think a lot of you know this history, but a part of the reason for going through it is to sort of remind you where this started and, and how we got to where we are today. And I think we learned a lot. Um, the picture you see here is David Vetter, the original bubble boy. Uh, the poor kid spent 12 years inside a sterile bubble. Um, and it wasn't until years after he passed away that we learned exactly what his uh, genetic uh, defect was. Based on work from the NIH by Warren Leonard and John O'Shea, we understood that it was either the gamma chain or JAK3 that led to this condition. And at the time those discoveries were made, I just started at Pfizer in a group that was tasked with coming up with a new drug uh, to prevent uh, rejection of, of kidney transplantation. We wanted to find something that was not cyclosporin. Um, and so we did that. Um, and because of the immunosuppression we saw in both our rodent studies as well as our synomologous monkey studies where we did life-supporting kidney transplants, uh, the FDA said, look, this is a really potent drug. Um, at the time, we thought it was a fairly clean JAK3 inhibitor. I will show you that it's really not, and you know that, um, but I'll, I'll touch upon that a bit, a bit more later. Um, but because of the uh, infections we saw and the lymphoma we saw in the monkeys that we transplanted, the FDA said you can't put this in normal volunteers. You have to go into patients. And so we chose psoriatic patients for our first in-human study. Um, it was a two-week study um, uh, in, in psoriatics, ascending dose. And what we saw was that there was unexpected efficacy even in this two-week study. And so that was sort of a harbinger of what ended up being a very a successful role for this drug to play, uh, which at that point, point had, become, had become named uh, tofacitinib. <clears throat> um, so uh, just to 
uh, harken back again to the original goal of the work that my lab was doing, we were trying to find drugs for kidney transplantation. Um, because of the unique uh, risks associated with getting a kidney transplant, one can't simply do transplants in rats. One had to do things in monkeys. Um, in addition, we knew at the time that if you do transplants in captive bred monkeys, who are quite clean, it's very easy to get them to accept their, uh, their graft. And so what we, what we did was we used wild-caught animals from the island of Mauritius, wild-caught cinnamolingus monkeys. Those animals, like humans, are filthy. They have plenty of viruses and bacteria. Um, and we learned a lot from that experience as well because it was closer to the real world. Um, what we showed is that monotherapy with uh, tofacitinib in these monkeys uh, was better than cyclosporin, so we went on to patients. Um, and patients were treated in a cyclosporin-free regimen um, with kidney transplants, both living donor as well as um, uh, non-living donors. Um, and patients uh, survived over five years uh, with their transplants on this drug. And so it was a very successful endeavor from that standpoint. Um, compared to cyclosporin, we also achieved our main goal, which was to prevent um, uh, damage the kidney uh, so that the kidney graft would last longer. And so the, the uh, rejection rate was equivalent, but the effects on uh, interstitial fibrosis um, and glomerular filtration were better than cyclosporin. Uh, unfortunately, Pfizer chose not to go all the way forward um, with this drug because of the uh, large cost of a phase three study and, and the size of the market. <clears throat> Um, so then again, as I told you, in, those very, in that initial study in patients, we saw hints of efficacy in psoriasis patients. Um, and at the time, uh, standard of care for psoriatics was biologics, anti-TNF. Uh, we went on and did a, a phase two and a phase three study in these, in these patients. Um, and that data is shown in this slide. Um, what, you're which, what you're seeing here are uh, two doses of tof tofacitinib, uh, either five or 10 milligrams BID, uh, compared to a Tanercept, which is one of the uh, standard of care time. Um, and the 10 milligram dose was equivalent um, to a Tanercept. Um, but at the end of the day, um, it was felt by the FDA that the risks it could not benefit. Um, the, 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 yeah, the efficacy here was not um, worth the risk that a psoriatic patient might encounter. Um, and, and again, this was early days for immunosuppressive therapy in autoimmune disease patients. <clears throat> At the same time, we started exploring autoimmune diseases of, of different kinds. Um, and my lab did a, a study with TOFA in a, uh, a therapeutic model of collagen-induced arthritis in mice. Uh, what you're looking at um, on, the on, the, let's see, on the left are the joints of vehicle-treated uh, anim vehicle animals in a mouse model of CIA, um, lots of cellular infiltration and panis formation. On the right, tofacitinib, and you can see very few cells coming in. And I think it was this, this uh, image, really, that convinced some of the rheumatoid arthritis docs that we talked to that this drug might have legs in RA. Um, and so it went forward in patients initially um, who had already failed uh, biological therapy plus methotrexate, and that was a big deal because these were fairly uh, severe patients. Um, it was approved in 2012, um, and I'll note that it was 17 years after we started working on it in the lab. Uh, things take uh, not quite as long uh, as, they, as they used to, but I think part of this was our diversion uh, down the transplant road. <clears throat> Uh, it's been approved for psoriatic arthritis, as, as you know, and it, it look, is looking good in uh, ulcerative colitis. Um, so just to touch upon the specificity, um, because I was not a particularly good enzymologist uh, back in 1993, I thought we had a very specific JAK3 inhibitor. And as many of you know, a TOFA is not specific for JAK3. It hits JAK1 as hard. Um, it hits JAK2 a little bit, and it also has some activity against TIC2. But what I'm showing you here on this graph um, is a representation of the entire kind of the human kinome. As you know, there are, about, there are over 500 kinases in the human kinome. Um, what's seen in this graph uh, the, are individual uh, dots, red dots, showing the kinases that tofacitinib actually has some effect on. The larger that circle, um, the more potent it is. And so there's very large circles that you can see at about 11 o'clock um, on the, on the uh, diagram are JAK1, JAK2, JAK3. Um, and so that was confirmatory based on later enzymolo enzymology as well as cell-based data. Um, just, to, just to make sure you don't leave here thinking I was a complete moron, um, this is actually a pretty clean kinase inhibitor, and I'll show you a comparison to another uh, molecule that is on the market. Um, this is Sutent, um, and you can see that this particular molecule is not quite as clean as, as uh, tofacitinib. 
So what, what was lacking uh, back in 1993, which we now have access to and is making a world of difference in our ability to make very selective inhibitors. Um, at the time, no one was able to crystallize the kinase domain of JAX. Um, we have this now, and what you're looking at in the figure is the crystal structure of catalytic domain of JAK3 with tofacitinib in the ATP binding domain. Most kinase inhibitors actually do um, sit in that domain, um, but until we had crystal structures, it was very difficult to make them uniquely uh, specific without the knowledge of that structure. Um, what's even more interesting, and, and I think you've, you've heard about some of this at this meeting and you'll hear more about it, um, when you look at the sequence of the catalytic domain between all the four jacks, and we knew this 20 years ago and tried to take advantage of it, but it was verboten back then. Um, in a particular position in all the jacks, there's a serine, with the exception of jack 3, which has a cysteine. That cysteine allows you to make a covalent inhibitor of jack 3, which is exquisitely sensitive across the jack family. Um, again, 20 years ago when we proposed this, uh, making covalent inhibitors was a really scary thing to do. Um, there's obviously many cysteines in the body, uh, but the combination of knowing the structure of the catalytic domain, knowing where that cysteine is, and knowing how to make a molecule which will covalently grab that cysteine uh, now allows, to, allows us to make not only specific inhibitors, but we think uh, safe inhibitors. And the best example of this, of course, is abrutinib, uh, which is a, a covalent inhibitor of BTK, another kinase that has a serine at this location. And so we have much less fear, I think, but the, the jury's out. Until we get lots of human data, we're not going to be sure. Um, the other thing to point out, um, what you're looking at here is the stick figure of the JAK kinases. These are very large proteins. Uh, nobody has ever crystallized the entire protein. And I don't know if my pointer here is working or not. No. Okay. Um, so on the, on the uh, far right, the, the uh, JH1 domain is the catalytic domain. Um, and that's what we focused on for the most part in our, in our drug discovery. Um, adjacent to the, G, the catalytic domain is the uh, JH2 domain, or the so-called pseudokinase domain. Um, this, this domain has many of the sequence and structural elements of a kinase, but it lacks actual kinase activity because it lacks a couple of key residues. What we do know, however, is that this JH2 domain is incredibly important um, for these molecules. And we know that for a number of reasons. Uh, an early, uh, early um, information about this came from patients who have myelofibrosis. They have a mutation in the JH2 domain of their JAK2 protein. That leads to constitutive activation of JAK2 in the myelofibrosis that's seen. Um, and that led, of course, to ruxolitinib. Um, in addition, if you look at all the patients who have JAK3 skid, uh, mutations in their JAK3 protein and are therefore very immunosuppressed. Um, the vast majority of the mutations are actually in the JH2 domain, the pseudokinase domain um, of JAK3. And so we know it's critical uh, for the functioning of these proteins. Um, and what's unique about it is not only that it's, well, it's not a kinase itself, but it, the homology between kinases in the JH2 domain is much less. And so that gives us an opportunity to target the JH2 domain and hopefully make more specific molecules. In addition, if we can do that without making the covalent, that would be, that would be uh, we'd solve both, both issues. Um, and that's something that, that we and, and many other people are doing. <clears throat> Um, so just to sort of tell you where the, the field is now, really, um, what you're looking at here um, is a table uh, showing all of the cytokines, or many of the cytokines, that we know about today. When we started this work over 20 years ago, um, IL-15, I think, was the biggest cytokine we knew about. IL-17 had been discovered. Nobody knew it was important. Nobody cared about it. Obviously, things have changed a lot. But we now know about many more cytokines. We know which jacks control those cytokines. And what you're looking at here on the left of this table is a partial list of all the JAK inhibitors that are now in clinical trials by multiple companies around the world. And I'm sure there's more, but those are the ones that, that I was able to, uh, to track down. And what you can see is that different companies are taking a, different approaches, targeting individual JAKs to focus on specific um, um, specific cytokines that are important to their disease. Now, just to point out, it remains the case that JAK2 is the key specificity hurdle. Um, JAK2 controls the EPO receptor, the TPO receptor, and the growth hormone receptor, and that's something in general you need to stay away from. But JAK1 and JAK3 and TIC2 um, have the potential to provide drugs with increased, uh, po uh, increased efficacy and hopefully uh, better specificity.
And just to give you, an, again, a brief example, and I, I pulled this from, from Pfizer's website, um, Pfizer has a number of inhibitors of different flavors of specificity. They have a JAK1 inhibitor and atopic derm. Um, in phase two, they have both a JAK3 covalent as well as a TIC2 JAK1 dual inhibitor. Um, I think we will find out um, in the, over the course of the next year or two whether or not uh, targeting these kinases relatively selectively actually makes a difference. Um, we've done a lot of this work in, in cells, in animals. We really have to figure this out um, in, in patients. Um, and so, as you all know in this room, uh, JAKs have moved very strongly into dermatology. Um, there are numerous cells in the, in the skin, both uh, immune cells as well as structural cells, that either produce JAK kinase, JAK dependent cytokines or respond to them. And so people have obviously taken, taken the currently approved drugs, tofacitinib and ruxolitinib, and used them off-label in a variety of dermatological diseases. Um, testing of these drugs uh, topically has been less um, um, studied less, for sure. Um, all of them have been used, I think, in preclinical studies as topical formulated drugs. Uh, tofacitinib has been in clinical studies um, with a few of these diseases, atopic dermatitis, psoriasis, and dry eye. Um, and I think we'll find out over the, cor over the course of the next couple of years if this is going to be uh, useful or not. But I think the key thing to note, and, and here I'm showing you a, uh, just a, a cartoon that you all know very well. Um, this depicts the uh, layers of skin and the relevant um, um, actors that are important, for example, to vitiligo and alopecia. Um, in vitiligo, you're focused on the, on the epidermis, in, in alopecia and the dermis. How do you go about making drugs that will treat these particular skin diseases um, in a, in a, uh, in a uh, designed way? Um, and we know that all of these things can be treated with systemic, um, dr systemic JAK inhibitors, um, but I think we all worry about the immunosuppressive uh, side effects these drugs are going to have and the potential for infectious AEs. And so what's the best way to do that? And, and we've been thinking about this as, as many of you have. Um, you need to deliver the, the, the drug to the correct layer of the skin, and you can do that uh, both in animals as well as in uh, devices known as Franz chambers, which utilize uh, skin um, that's been harvested from animals. Um, you need adequate residence time. The drug has to survive and be in that particular layer of the skin long enough to have a, a reasonable effect on the pathway you're trying to block. Um, and you need to minimize the systemic exposure. And I think one of the ways that uh, a number of people are doing this is making what's called soft drugs. And that, that means basically making an inhibitor that will bind to its target, but once it gets into the systemic circulation, uh, when it's exposed to a variety of enzymes in the liver and elsewhere, that drug will fall apart quickly. Um, all, virtually all of us who came up through the ranks in big pharma were trained uh, for over and over again, we're trying to make drugs that have a half-life of 48 hours so you can take a pill once a day. Day. Um, well, this has sort of been turned on its head, and we're now looking for drugs that will fall apart once they get into the circulation. And that will make a that will hopefully make for an effective but safer um, uh, topical drug. And obviously, you need to have specificity for the key cytokine when you get into that relevant layer. So, if you're targeting vitiligo, you need to hit either JAK1 or JAK2 so you can uh, affect interferon gamma. Um, atopic dermatitis uh, would be JAK1 or JAK3 that you would be thinking about. Um, so, uh, again, we, we have, uh, you've all known, and you've all, all seen this and, and benefited from, I hope, um, JAK inhibitors have been approved for a handful of indications, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, and myelofibrosis. Um, there have been a numerous sort of off-label uh, proof-of-concept studies with these drugs dosed systemically um, in autoimmune diseases, including um, diseases of the skin. <clears throat> Um, I think the soft approach will allow us to explore the possibility that drugs that are active in the skin but don't survive for a long time in the circulation could A, be effective, and B, hopefully be um, uh, less problematic in terms of infections. Um, again, the crystal structure of the JAK kinases has really allowed us to hone in on the specificity of these molecules. It's not something that we had access to 20, 25 years ago. Um, covalent inhibitors now are, are thought to be doable. Um, a lot of people are doing that, and uh, quite uh, miraculously, it's JAK3 that has that wonderful cysteine in the catalytic domain, allowing us to get away from uh, the biggest hurdle we have in the JAK family, which is JAK2. 
Um, and then more recently, people are thinking very hard about this pseudo-regulatory domain, the pseudokinase domain, the JH2. If we can target that domain effectively and inhibit the kinase in a non-covalent way, we could potentially make very selective drugs um, that uh, do not have the potential liability of a covalent uh, molecule. And I'll leave you with um, a question that I certainly think about a lot. Um, will it be sequential therapy that gives us sort of the holy grail for these patients? Can we treat with systemic oral therapy for a period of time, knock their disease down, and then come in with a good topical drug and, and make sure the disease doesn't come back? Um, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Paul. Who better to catch us up on Jax than the creator of Zelgen? <laughs> Thanks for your time uh, this year as well as last. So the last I heard, uh, Abir al -Sarhid, um had not uploaded the talk. Did, did you upload your talk? You did? Okay. Can we call that up and, and make sure that's here? Uh, from Cambridge, Massachusetts is the talk. Uh... Okay. We had a disappearing talk. Um, we will bring a beer back uh, a little bit later. But we're going to start with CXCL9 drives morphia pathogenesis in, my, in mice. This is Drumal Patel, actually from my lab. Um, and uh, come on up. Remember your time. And uh, I promise to get back to a beer's talk uh, probably next. Thanks. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, this project is about exploring the role of uh, cytokines in the pathogenesis of morphia, and then try to determine if there's a way to prevent morphia by inhibiting uh, cytokine production or function. So morphia is a rare autoimmune skin disorder of the dermis and subcutis, which leads to development of painless, discolored patches on the skin, as seen in the images on the right. Um, initially, there is inflammation that likely leads to sclerosis. Morphia has a variety of presentation. Um, affected skin gradually becomes hard, thickened, dry, and shiny. Hair follicles and sweat glands usually disappear from the lesional skin. Morphia can present anywhere on the body, uh, but typically affects the chest, back, and the abdomen. In cases where the lesions are affecting the face, the arm, um, the legs, the patients can have significant comorbid psychological issues. Uh, sclerosis skin near the joint can also impair joint mobility. Um, annual incidence of morphia in the uh, United States is three per 100,000 people. Um, the treatment is aimed at reducing inflammation to prevent development of sclerosis. Here's a patient uh, who had early inflammatory uh, skin lesion who was treated with uh, methotrexate and prednisone for two months, and it prevented development of significant uh, sclerosis. Um, current treatment options are uh, limited, and they primarily target the immune system. A few studies have examined the molecular underpinning of morphia, which has prevented development of targeted therapies. Um, methotrexate and prednisones have good evidence uh, for efficacy, but their use is limited due to significant uh, side effect and toxicity. Um, the goal of this project was to uh, search for a targeted treatment. Um, our collaborators, um, at Jacobi Lab uh, in uh, UT Southwestern have shown that uh, CXCR3 uh, ligands, especially CXCL9 and CXCL10, are elevated in lesional morphia skin. As you can see in the image on the left, uh, patients who have morphia have increased concentration of CXCL9 and 10 compared to controls. And on the right, you can see that CXCL9 concentration in the serum has been shown to correlate with modified localized scleroderma skin severity index seen in the figure. CXCL9 and uh, CXCL10 are induced via interferon gamma. As you can see in the diagram below, the interferon gamma activates the JAX STAT pathway in the skin resident immune cells, which leads to the production of CXCL9 and CXCL10, which then go on and acts on the CXCL3 receptor to, receptor to cause downstream effects. Um, the animation on the slide is, uh, highlights the working model of chemokines in morphia pathogenesis. So in the dermis, um, we have resident immune cells um, interferon gamma, which can be released in response to an insult or an injury, uh, activates the JAK-STAT pathway within this immune cell. The cell then goes on to produce uh, CXCL9 and CXCL10, 
which then goes on and acts on CXCR3 receptors. CXCR3 receptors are present on multiple cells, including T cells, macrophages, other immune cells, and even fibroblasts. Uh, downstream activation leads to uh, stimulation of fibroblasts, which increase collagen deposition and lead to the phenotype of morphia. Um, now the role of uh, JAK inhibitors in this pathway. JAK inhibitors can prevent um, the activation of JAK's STAT pathway in the skin resident immune cells, uh, decreasing the production of CXCL9 and 10, which prevent ac activation of CXCL3 receptors, which prevent downstream activation and decrease deposition of collagen. Uh, in order to better study the pathogenesis of morphia, we created a mouse model uh, that emulates the skin cell sclerosis seen in human morphia. We started with an adult mice, uh, shaved their dorsal skin in two locations as seen here, injected 50 microliters of uh, biomycin to both those locations for 12 days. At the end of 12 days, uh, the mice were sacrificed and that injected skin was analyzed for um, using histology and circle assay for dermal thickness for, as a measure of fibrosis and skin was also analyzed using flow cytometry to quantify chemokines. After 12 days, when the skin was analyzed, the epidermis and the dermis uh, showed elevation of CXCL9 and 10 expression as compared to the control. The control mice were treated with PBS instead of bleomycin. Uh, this correlates well with the previous human study, which showed that CXCL9 and 10 expression is elevated in human morphia. Uh, the lymph node ad analysis of the mice showed that there was no elevation of CXCL9 and 10 compared to the control, which again shows that our model highlighted the morphia, which is skin-limited sclerosis and not systemic. Um, to, uh, we further studied chemokine role in morphia pathogenesis by placing CXCL9 knockout, CXCL10 knockout, CXCR3 knockout mice in the morphia model. All these mice were treated with bleomycin in the treatment group and PBS in the control group. And the study, uh, the study showed that uh, dermal and epidermal thickness, which is a measure of fibrosis, was decreased in CXCL9 knockout and CXCR3 knockout mice. And the circle assay, which measures collagen, showed that uh, collagen deposition was similar in CXL9 knockout and 3 knockout mice between the treatment and control group. And this shows that uh, CXL9 is instrumental in morphia pathogenesis, um, as you can see here. Since uh, CXCL9 production is induced by interferon gamma via the JAK STAT pathway, we tried to determine if inhibiting the JAK uh, can prevent development of morphia. Uh, we predated mice with five days of oral uh, systemic ruxolitinib, which is a JAK1 and 2 inhibitor. Um, these pre uh, then these mice were placed in the morphia model and injected with 50 microliters of bleomycin along with oral ruxolitinib for 12 days. And at the end of the 12 days, the mice were sacrificed and the skin was analyzed using histology and circle assay uh, to measure fibrosis. Uh, based on the histological analysis, the mice treated with ruxolitinib had decreased collagen deposition um, and dermal thickness uh, than mice who did not receive ruxolitinib. This shows that treatment with ruxolitinib can prevent development of morphia in mice. Uh, in conclusion, uh, mice treated with bleomycin show up regulation of CXCL9. CXCL9 drives morphia pathogenesis in mice. Uh, ruxolitinib prevents fibrosis in uh, mouse morphia model. Further studies could examine ruxolitinib as a treatment for mouse and human morphia. Uh, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Heidi Jacoby uh, from UT Southwestern, who runs the Morphia in Adult and Children cohort, who provided us, provided us with uh, human data. Thank you. Thank you, Drummond. Thank you, Drummond. Thank you, Drummond. Uh, If you hold on, we have uh, just a little bit of time. One, one question. Great. So. You, you showed the uh, uh, prophylactic uh, efficacy of the ruxolitinib. How, how long can you wait post um, bleomycin injection before you can actually tr prevent the fibrosis? So can you treat after you start the bleomycin? So uh, that's a good point. Uh, we didn't try that experiment, but I think, uh, I mean, it would still be uh, effective because initially there's inflammation and then there's sclerosis. So if we catch it in the inflammation phase and give ruxolitinib to prevent inflammation, we can prevent fibrosis. But after a certain point, it probably won't be effective. Mm -hmm. Great, thank, you. thank you, Drummond. Uh, we are going to move on to the next uh, speaker, Marinal Sakhar from uh, University of Michigan, talking about uh, type 1 interferon uh, responses in their role in cutaneous lupus and how uh, I'm guessing that JAK inhibitors might be effective. <laughs> Oh, sorry.
good afternoon everybody today i am going to talk about <coughs> photosensitivity and heightened type 1 interferon responses in cutaneous lupus are driven by elevated interferon kappa patients uh, with uh, cle exhibit increased type 1 interferon activity in their blood which correlates with cutaneous disease and increased expression of interferon responsive genes in lesional skin cutaneous lesion in lupus are characterized by infiltration of plasma cytoid dendritic cells and their production of interferon alpha has been suggested as the main type of interferon signaling in CLE. However, the source of interferon in cutaneous lupus has not been systemically evaluated. So we analyzed microarray data from normal and CLE patient, uh, normal and CLE patient skin sample and we observed only interferon alpha and interferon kappa are increased in CLE skin. We found interferon kappa is highly increased in the epidermis of the CLE compared to normal skin, which correlates with the type 1 interferon, enhance of the type 1 interferon response in the CLE patient. So this result suggests that interferon kappa is upregulated in lupus epidermal keratinocyte. We also found that uh, phosphorylation of STAT1 and STAT2 uh, is increased in the CLE, which, in, uh, which indicates that type 1 interferon response in CLE uh, could be mediated through phosphorylation of STAT1 and STAT2. So it is, there is little bit known about the uh, interferon response in uh, normal skin, we analyzed microarray data from three different uh, major cell types in skin, keratinocytes, fibroblast, and endothelial cell. We found uh, interferon response genes are significantly increased in keratinocyte. And we also found that only interferon kappa is highly exp in expressed in uh, uh, keratinocyte, but not in the other two cell types. When we transferred the conditional medium from the keratinocyte, we found that uh, interferon response genes are activated, which is interferon copper dependent manner. So this result suggests that keratinocyte exhibit baseline type 1 interferon activity through the expression of interferon copper. Then we wanted to know the little bit downstream signaling pathway of the type 1 interferon uh, responses, and this one uh, is known uh, signaling pathway. And we deleted tyrosine kinase 2 uh, using CRISPR-Cas9 pathway, uh, CRISPR pathway, and we found that a significant decrease of the type 1 interferon responses in uh, unstimulated keratinocyte as well as uh, interferon, alpha, uh, interferon alpha stimulation. So this result shows that TIC2 knockout kerat keratinocytes are unresponsive to exogenous interferon alpha stimulation. We also observed that uh, recombinant interferon kappa and interferon alpha induce interferon kappa mRNA expression, which is abolished in tyrosine kinase 2 knockout keratinocyte. This result shows that tyrosine kinase 2 is required for the baseline and exogenous type 1 interferon uh, responses for the and for the transcriptional activation of interferon kappa. Then we, we uh, wanted to know a little bit downstream of this pathway. So we analyzed uh, phosphorylation of STAT1 and STAT2 in resting tyrosine kinase 2 and interferon kappa knockout keratinocytes. And, and we observed that uh, this phosphorylation of STAT1 and STAT2 is decreased in both of the resting uh, knockout keratinocytes. And also, it shows that interferon kappa delayed phosphorylation upon exogenous alpha, interferon alpha treatment. This result shows that the interferon kappa amplifies and accelerates interferon alpha responses in keratinocyte. So this result shows that interferon kappa is required for rapid keratinocyte responses to the exogenous interferon alpha. So then we wanted to know about the interferon response, type 1 interferon responses in uninvolved SLE keratinocyte. We observed that interferon kappa is highly expressed in the SLE keratinocyte 
as well as uh, we see increased phosphorylation of STAT1 and STAT2. We also uh, found that in condition, condition medium from the SLE keratinocyte enhances type 1 interferon responses compared to normal keratinocyte, normal human keratinocyte. This result suggests that SLE keratinocytes have increased interferon kappa expression which drive the inter type 1 interferon response. Then we wanted to know about the role of interferon kappa in the photosensitivity and it is not very much unknown that uh, uh, CLE epidermis has prominent apoptosis compared to healthy control which indicates the photosensitivity and this result shows that uh, UV exposure induces apoptosis in SLE keratinocyte whereas baricitinib treatment suppresses these events. Similarly, we found that interferon cup overexpression uh, induces the UV exposed apoptosis whereas uh, interferon kappa knockout has the opposite role. So this result suggests that uh, interferon kappa plays an important role in controlling photosens photosensitivity. So in summary, the only type 1 interferon that is constitutively expressed in keratinocyte and normal skin is interferon kappa. Interferon kappa maintains basal interferon activity in keratinocyte that increased keratinocyte sensitivity to other uh, outside interferons. This autocrine loop uh, is hyperactive in lupus skin and is likely one of the main source of type 1 interferon activity in lupus skin. Autocrine interferon kappa activity has a major role in UV induced apoptosis. So finally, I would like to thank my mentor, Dr. Yvonne Gardjonsen, and I also thank Dr. Michelle Kalimberg for mentoring this project. And also I'd like to thank my lab mates and I thank to my funding sources. Thank you, everyone. So we have time for one quick question. Um, have you looked at the effect of interferon kappa on plasma cytoid disease? Uh, or whether it's produced by plasma cytoid disease? Yeah, we, we analyzed the interferon kappa in the dermis area. <coughs> like, we, uh, we stained the interferon kappa in the whole skin, but we found the interferon kappa expression only in the epidermis, but we did not see interferon kappa expression in the dermis area. So it, it, look, it makes sense that interferon kappa is, might not be expressed in the uh, from the plasma dendritic cells. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So we are now ready for Abir um, Al Sarkid from Cambridge, talking about tofacitinib for uh, dermatomyositis. Hello everyone, I'm Abir, a dermatologist, and I'm currently doing my fellowship in dermatology or rheumatology at Brigham and Women's Hospital. I'm delighted to present to you today the use of tofacitinib for refractory cutaneous dermatomyositis, an expanded series of seven patients. I have no relevant financial disclosures, and most of the treatments I'm going to discuss today are off-label. So as you all know, cutaneous dermatomyositis is a challenging skin disease as seen in this patient who has been refractory to most of the known treatments for cutaneous dermatomyositis, including IVIG, until tofacitinib was used. So what's the rationale of using JAK inhibition in dermatomyositis? So studies have shown an upregulation of type 1 interferon signature in the muscle, blood, and skin of dermatomyositis patients. Furthermore, my mentor, Dr. Vlegels, have studied the correlation between type 1 interferon signature in the blood and skin disease activity and severity as measured by the validated scoring system, SIDASI. This was studied in 40 of her dermatomyositis patients, and they found that patients with mild disease, which is defined as a SIDASI score of less than 12, had almost always a normal type 1 interferon signature in the blood. 
whereas patients with moderate to severe disease, which is defined as a SEDASI score of more than or equal 12, had almost always an increase in type 1 interferon signature. And this suggests a, correla a pathogenic correlation between type 1 interferon, particularly interferon beta, and skin disease activity and severity in dermatomyositis. The first successful use of JAK inhibition in DM has been published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2014, in which a patient who was treated with roxalitinib for myelofibrosis showed accidentally an improvement of her refractory dermatomyositis, with reduction of her SEDASI score to zero and improvement of her muscle strength. Not only that, but she was also, uh, we were, they were also able to stop prednisone, mycophenolate, and taper off her IVIG. We subsequently published the first novel series of the use of tofacitinib in refractory cutaneous dermatomyositis. We had a total of three patients, and the primary endpoint was improvement of skin disease as measured by the validated scoring system, SEDASI, where the secondary endpoints were other concurrent therapies and adverse events during therapy. We had a total of three patients, all were female, two had classic disease and one amyopathic. They had refractory disease to multiple treatment regimens, and two of them were on the five milligram twice daily of tofacitinib, which is the RA approved dose, whereas one was on the 10 milligram twice daily. All of them had clinically significant improvement in their SEDASI score. Circling back to our first patient who had refractory disease, you can see her improvement with tofacitinib 10 milligram twice daily, a before and after photo, improvement of her V chest erythema, as well as her holster sign. Our second patient also had improvement of her hand disease, and our last patient in this cohort showing improvement of her facial erythema and pruritus. So this was published in JAMA Dermatology in 2016. We subsequently had a total of four additional patients with refractory cutaneous DM, all were females, three had classic disease and one amyopathic, all had refractory disease to multiple treatments, and three of them were on the higher dosage of 10 milligram twice daily, one on the five milligram. All of them had clinically significant improvement in their SEDASI score. So this is one of the most severely affected patients in our cohort. She was a Jehovah's Witness, so IVIG was not an option for her. And you can see an imp the improvement in her skin disease following tofacitinib 10 milligram. Another patient with improvement of her disease before and after photos. And this patient has less pronounced in improvement, but her nail folds looked really better after tofacitinib, and she had the resolution of her macroscopic telangiectasia. The last patient in this cohort had improvement of her refractory scalp disease with severe itch. So in summary, we had a total of seven patients with refractory cutaneous dermatomyositis. The mean improvement in SEDASI was 13, and based on the most recent validation study, a four to five point reduction in SEDASI is considered to be clinically significant. No adverse events were noted during treatment duration that has ranged from four months to 20 months. And tofacitinib enabled us to discontinue other immune suppressive th treatment, and it was the sole treatment in three of our patients. However, However, four were also additionally on hydroxychloroquine, and one remained on IVIG, but we were able to ta taper off her IVIG from every four weeks to every eight weeks after adding tofacitinib. All our patients had improvement in their pruritus, which is considered to be a marker of skin disease activity. And five of our seven patients transitioned from moderate severe to mild disease, which is defined as a reduction of their SEDASI score to a score of 14 or less. The two other patients who did not fulfill this criteria still had a clinically substantial improvement. Uh, we found that patients on higher doses of tofacitinib, 10 milligram twice daily, had better response, suggesting a dose-response relationship as seen in other inflammatory skin diseases, including alopecia areata and vitiligo.
So in, in conclusion, when do we consider JAK inhibition in dermatomyositis? At this point of time, it can, it can be considered in patients who have refractory t disease to other conventional treatments or have contraindication to th those treatments or side effects from them. But hopefully with more studies in the future, we, can, we might use JAK inhibition earlier in the therapeutic ladder of cutaneous dermatomyositis. Thank you so much. Thank you, Beer. That was wonderful. Uh, we have time for one question. I see one's ready to go. Hi. Thanks for that, uh, Chris Bunk, uh, London. Do you or anybody else have any experience in paraneoplastic dermatomyositis? Which so, would be very challenging. Right. So all of our seven patients were started on tofacitinib after three years of more, like at least three years after the onset of their disease. So they were outside the period of high malignancy risk, which is usually the first year and up to three years. So we made sure that we ruled out underlying paraneoplastic dermatomyositis before starting JAK inhibition or other immune suppression therapy, which we usually do in our patients. Yes, thank you, but that wasn't quite my question. Has okay. anybody used the drug in this situation of paraneoplastic dermatomyositis? So uh, what I know is like those seven patients were the first patients to be treated with, uh, with tofacitinib for DM, and the case that was published in 2014 was roxalitinib with an underlying myelofibrosis. They were wondering that if it was a paraneoplastic DM, but the disease um, responded irrespective of their underlying malignancy. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Sounds like there might be some concern about using JAK inhibitors if it were perineoplastic, uh, except in the case of myelofibrosis, in which that it is FDA, uh, JAK inhibitors are FDA approved, uh, particularly ruxolitinib. <coughs> so we'll move on uh, to uh, Heike Hauerkamp. We'll be talking about the role of JAK signaling in viral versus microbial infections. And this uh, is an important question, as we always wonder what the side effects of using uh, JAK inhibitors might be in patients. Thank you. Well, so first of all, I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present our data here today. So as just said, we have been investigating tofacitinib and uh, it, its effects on antiviral and antimicrobial immune defense. And so, um, as you all know, the check stat pathway is an important pathway, and uh, cytokines that are infected, uh, affected in this um, pathway are RL22, or RL29, uh, but also interference, but also other check associated receptors are found that bind RL6 or RL23, which are important for the differentiation towards uh, TH17 cells. So, uh, you also all know that there are some severe side events that are found in clinical trials. So, um, for example, upper respiratory tract infections or also ser other serious infections and also herpes zoster, which I will focus a little bit more on. So we were wondering if or how does tofacitinib influence the expression and production of antiviral and antimicrobial peptides. So we were... Um, our hypothesis, our model was this way. So we had carotenocytes that we stimulated with IL-29 or interferon gamma to elicit an antiviral activity, such as gene expression of Annex 1, OIS-2, or IS-215. Or in contrast, we stimulated carotenocytes with IL-22 or IL-17 to elicit an antiviral, uh, antimicrobial activity. And so our hypothesis was if you block uh, the in the carotenocytes with tofacitinib, you'll end up with a um, decreased antiviral activity and also a decreased antimicrobial activity, which might explain uh, the bacterial and viral infections that are seen in um, the clinical trials. So we started off uh, performing on microarray, where we had untreated carotenocytes versus carotenocytes that have been treated with tofacitinib. And so in the uh, upper circle, uh, you can see um, antiviral peptides, such as MX1, ISG15, and OS2, which are clearly down-regulated in presence of tofacitinib. When you look at the lower circle, you can find um, S100 proteins that are elicit antimicrobial activity, but they don't seem to be affected in our microarray analysis. 
Also, I displayed the data a little bit different with a network graphic where you can see in uh, red the down-regulated genes and all those uh, clusterings, or it's a prominent pattern of all those um, genes that are associated with antiviral activity. And so we uh, went on to evaluate or our microarray, and so I've displayed the S100A7 um, gene expression carotenoids here. So we have been um, simulated the carotenoids further with LPS, LTA, or LIM, which is a surface molecule from uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, but also we simulated with R17 or R22 to elicit an antimicrobial response. And uh, on the left-hand panel, you can see our controls where we have the untreated carotenoids, DMSO as uh, um, solvent, and also tofacitinib in two different concentrations. So you can see that if you have antimicrobial uh, stimulants present, there's a slight upregulation of S100 protein in carotenoids. But if you further have the presence of tofacitinib, uh, there is no significant uh, change in gene expression of S100 protein. Similarly, it looks if you have R17, R17 does clearly upregulate S100A7, and, um, but if, the, if there's tofacitinib present, it doesn't change um, the um, gene expression pattern. Similarly, for, S, uh, for R22, if you have R22 added to your carotenoids, you get an increased expression of S100A7. And if you have tofacitinib present, there's a slight but not significant decrease in S100 um, A17 expression. Just a very similar pattern you can see for LL37. Um, you have an upregulation with L17, but uh, if there's tofacitinib present, it doesn't change uh, the, the gene expression of LL37. Um, so we also went on to have a look at MX1, which is an antiviral peptide. Um, and so here we have also, again, the controls, LP, uh, the, the stimulants, LPS, LTA, and LAM. But here we changed our inter, uh, cytokines to interferon gamma and IL-29, which is also known as interferon uh, lambda. And um, these two clearly elicit a strong uh, increase in MX1 gene expression as you can see in the lower panels. And also, if you look at our controls, we have, uh, again, untreated carotenoids. And if you um, already at baseline level, MX1 gene expression is significantly downregulated if tofacitinib is present. Looking at the other um, simulations that we did, so we found that, um, say, for interferon gamma, it's Oh, interferon gamma only, you get a high upregulation of MX1, but in the presence of tofacitinib, especially in the higher concentration of 600 nanomolars, there is a downregulation of MX1 nearly to baseline level. Similar thing can be seen for R29, where you also get a downregulation of MX1 gene expression in presence of tofacitinib compared to without tofacitinib. Another gene that we uh, tested here is ISG15, and here you can clearly see that there is a similar pattern. Um, it's uh, in presence of tofacitinib, it's clearly downregulated in our carotenoids. So we have uh, tested some other antimicrobial peptides, such as HBD2 and other S100 proteins, and we can basically see no effect under check inhibition, but if we test um, on all our antiviral peptides, we see a clear down regulation of all our tested antiviral peptides, such as OSL or also L29. So we then just had a brief look at T cells. So in order for the T cells to produce the cytokines that then can act on keratinocytes and induce an antiviral response, they need to be activated. And so we here um, investigated uh, CD69, which is a surface expression marker, and for activation on T cells, and we used um, anti CD2, anti CD2 receptor antibody to uh, increase the CD69 expression on T cells. Um, we also had LPS and varicella zoster virus uh, glyco, glycoprotein E, and you can see that for both uh, varicella and LPS simulation, if the tofacitinib is present, you get an um, down regulation of CD69 
which indicates that tofacitinib inhibits the T-cell activation after microbial component stimulation. And so with this, I can sum this up. So if we have uh, carotenocytes that are treated with tofacitinib and um, IL-22 or IL-17 present, the antimicrobial activity basically is not affected, but while you have uh, IL-29 or interferon gamma presence, or even at baseline level, if there's presence of tofacitinib, the antiviral activity is drastically downregulated, and which might indicate why the uh, patients have more um, viral infections. And so with this, I come to an end. I want to acknowledge Stefan, who's my supervisor, and Lisa and Alina, who are my medical students, and all my lab team that has been participating and supporting me. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you, Heike. Uh, we don't have time for questions, so we're going to move on. So next is Lynn Cornelius, who will talk about JAK inhibition in the setting of UV-induced changes in melanocytes. Uh, interesting topic. Okay, thanks so much to the organizers <clears throat> for inviting us to present our work. See, I have no relevant conflicts of interest to report. So um, the early events that occur in UV-induced melanoma are really fairly undescribed. <clears throat> so we hypothesize that repeated UV exposure in melanocytes induces a senescence-associated secretory phenotype, or SASP, that acts in a paracrine pro-inflammatory manner, resulting in cells acquiring this persistent interferon-stimulated gene signature and a selective pro-survival advantage that promotes survival of cells that carry a significant UV mutational burden. In order to do this, we took primary human melanocytes, light pigmented and dark pigmented, and developed a UV radiation protocol that was either single dose or repeated intermittent dose, as shown here. We tested cells at various time points. In between the UV radiation, the cells were normally passaged. I'd like to point out that at day 28, these cells were 14 days status post any UV exposure. We first wanted to look at UVB-induced DNA damage, and we did this both in the light pigmented and dark pigmented cells as shown here. We looked at this via H2AX phosphorylated foci staining. H2AX is phosphorylated and localizes to the nucleus at the site of DNA double-stranded breaks. As we can see here in both the light pigmented and dark pigmented cells, there's an equivalent amount of double-stranded breaks. However, after intermittent UV exposure and two weeks following any UV exposure, we ended up with higher levels and retention of these DNA double-stranded breaks in the light pigmented cells. Similarly, we looked at um, beta-gal staining for senescence, and senescence in these UV-irradiated cells remained at higher levels two weeks following UV radiation. So we were very interested in what the SAFs does instigate, which is an interference-stimulated gene signature, and we wanted to look at what happened after the intermittent UV exposure and 28 days, two weeks following the last exposure. This was done by RT-PCR, and as you can see here, um, we interrogated several genes, some of which um, are IL-6, which we've heard a little bit about, but IL-6 was interrogated because it's known to induce the um, senescence response, as well as be very important in cancer-induced inflammation and genotoxic stress. As you can see, for, at 14 days, which is um, after our intermittent exposure, we had marked elevation and interference-stimulated genes, MX1 and OAS2. But interestingly enough, particularly in the light pigmented cells, this elevation remained at 28 days following normal passage of these cells. So we then turn to what is normally known as some of the proteins that are upregulated in um, senescence and in DNA damage. And if you can, as you can see in the 14-day Western blot, P53 accumulation occurs along with P21 and P16, which are cell cycle arrest genes. But also we had, um, activate, we had um, expression of STAT as well as activation of STAT1 and MX1, which is, was one of our target genes of interest. 
If we then looked at these cells after two weeks in culture, what we found was that the light pigmented cells lost that P53 accumulation and the target gene P21. However, it retained the um, STAT expression, the activation of STAT, and the MX1 in contradistinction to the dark pigmented cells. Although we could recapitulate some of this upregulation of the interferon stimulated genes by exposure to IL-6 of our naive keratinocytes, we wanted to actually look at other proteins that may be involved. We therefore explored um, damage-associated molecular pattern proteins, or DAMPs, that have been known to be important in the senescence response. We were particularly interested in HMGB1 and HMGB2, which have been implicated in senescence. These danger uh, signaling proteins, or also called alarmins, are active uh, in various ways. However, they signal most commonly through NF-kappa B to then induce the cell to secrete pro-inflammatory cy cytokines and create an inflammatory environment. We, in fact, found that UVB induces HMGB1 expression in light pigmented cells, as shown here in this Western blot. Also, um, NF-kappa B was induced. The interesting pattern of HMGB1 was one of probably initial release from some necrotic cells and then probably active secretion. HMGB2 and S100A, also alarmins, were expressed at increasing levels. Rage expression uh, protein increase, which is a well-described phenomenon when Rage engages its ligand, HMGB1 or HMGB2. We wanted to assure that at 14 days following our intermittent exposure that HMGB1 was actually in the environment, and we did find these levels at nanograms amount in our um, supernatant. We went, then wanted to see if HMGB1 rage engagement had a contribution to our UVB-induced ISG expression. To do this, we performed knockdown of rage using shRNA that was specific to the rage receptor and scramble constructs. We did lentiviral infection to accomplish this in primary uh, light pigmented human melanocytes. And as seen here, we got a, uh, we got a decrease in rage expression. We then took the cells and wanted to see what would happen if we exposed them, the knockdown cells and the control scramble cells, to uh, HMGB1 or the ligand. And in the control scramble cells, you can see we get um, not only our expression of MX1, but also JAK2 activation and ERK activation um, along with um, the previous things that we have discussed. However, in our knockdown cells, all of these responses were either abrogated or abolished, particularly the JAK activation. We then wanted to look at our UVB exposed cells, and again, looking at by RT-PCR, we found that in the RAGE knockdown cells, we had no expression or minimal expression of RAGE following UV, so we adequately did that. However, also our ISG response genes, MX1 and IRF7, were markedly diminished um, after exposure uh, to, um, after, after having knocked down the RAGE um, receptor. So, in that it was intriguing to us that JAK was involved in this response, so we wanted to use JAK inhibitors in our UVB exposed cells. To do that, we intermittently exposed our melanocytes and then cultured them in the presence of ruxolimitib, a JAK1 and 2 inhibitor. And I just want to highlight at time zero, you can see that our normal um, suspects are MX1. Here we have JAK1 and 2 upregulate, uh, activated, as well as MX1 and STAT. However, 24 hours in the presence of a JAK inhibition, all of these responses, again, are either abrogated or decreased. We looked at RT-PCR, uh, utilizing the JAK inhibitor for 24 hours after UV exposure, and again, we found downregulation of our ISG gene expression. So finally, I want to tell you that we had previously shown that UVB primed, intermittently primed melanocytes had a decreased level of apoptosis when exposed to high levels of UV. So they tended to accommodate um, to that insult. So what we did, I want to show you in this first slide, if you look at the green and the red that are highlighted here, if you compare our UVB naive, so they hadn't seen UV, scramble cells to our UVB primed knockdown cells, or, ray, or excuse me, to our UVB primed um, control vector cells in red, you can see how our um, UVB prime cells had a decreased level of apoptosis when exposed to high levels of UV at 300 or 600 uh, millijoules. This is the same um, graph, but just highlighting two other things. When we knock down RAGE, so in our UVB primed RAGE knockdown shown in blue, 
compared to our UVB primed scramble cells, we see that that effect of decrease in apoptosis is somewhat abrogated. Therefore, we concluded that this axis contributes to UVB induced resistance to apoptosis. So in summary, uh, we've shown that intermittently exposed UVB melanocytes demonstrate persistent ISG expression. They release damps. The prime melanocytes by UVB are relatively resistant to apoptosis compared to UVB naive cells. JAK inhibition reduces UVB induced HMGB1 and ISG expression. And depletion of RAGE decreases our UVB induced resistance to apoptosis. I'd like to leave you with a proposed model where similar to chemo and radio resistance, potentially these cells are, are uh, almost clonal, can develop a clonal kind of characteristic where they then may have something to do as they accumulate their UV mutations in the early development of melanoma. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, in the interest of time, we'll move on to the next speaker. Interesting, though. Um, it appears jacks are involved in all aspects of life, it seems, Paul. <laughs> um, so I'd like to, uh, to invite Jindapa Tamakriangrai to come up and speak about uh, jack inhibition and hair growth. Good afternoon, audience. My name is Jinda Patam and I'm from Jalapur International College of Medicine, Thammasat University, Thailand. I'm honored to be here in presenting the research entitled Efficacy of Topical Tofacitinib in Promoting Hair Growth in Non Scarring Alopecia Possible Mechanism via VHF Induction. And First of all, I believe that everyone here knows the importance of hair loss. It is one of the most common dermatological conditions seen by dermatologists worldwide, and uh, especially AGA or non-scarring alopecia, uh, or androgenetic alopecia, which is the most common form of non-scarring alopecia. But the current available treatment of AGA still have some problems on efficacy and side effects. And, uh, the current available treatment of AJ includes oral finasteride and topical form of minoxidil. Plus, it would be interesting if we could develop another new therapeutic drug in treating non-scarring alopecia with good efficacy and less side effects. Tofacitinib is JAK3 inhibitor as an immunomodulatory agent, and many speakers previous has been mentioned of using tofacitinib in treating many skin diseases, and also we used to treat in non-scarring alopecia. For example, in this clinical trial from Jabari using oral form of tofacitinib in alopecia universalis, which is a severe form of alopecia areata, and reported a successful case of treating uh, alopecia universalis in, the, in this patient using oral form of tofacitinib and corresponding with the decline of CXCL10 and uh, cytotoxic T cell after the treatment also confirmed the results. Another example from Liu using ointment form of 2% tofacitinib in the treatment of alopecia areata, a pilot study of 10 patients. Although some cases revealed of no or partial response, but in this case, you could demonstrate it of significant area of hair regrowth according to the treatment of this patient. For our research, we aim to compare the promoting effect of 2% topical tofacitinib in, uh, to 5% topical form of minoxidil, which is a standard treatment of AGA on hair growth in mice model, and also to determine the level of anagen and uh, anagen maintaining factors after the treatment of those two. We started with using C57 VL SLAT6 male mice at week 8 week old, total 28 divided equally into group of 7, applied 2% tofacitinib, 5% minoxidil, and the rest are control, including DMSO, which is a vehicle of tofacitinib, and ethanol, which is a vehicle of minoxidil and applied once daily until the experimental endpoint on day 21, and uh, we collected clinical data using clinical uh, digital microscope and photograph, and then at the experimental endpoint, we've done the biopsy. The data was analyzed into clinical, histopathological, and immunological results. 
Our clinical results demonstrated that tofacitinib promotes faster onset of hairy growth since day 7, and when continued treated until the experimental endpoint on day 21, almost full area of hairy growth could be seen in tofacitinib treated group, uh, compared to partial area of hairy growth according to minoxidil and control group. Corresponding with this graph, you could see significant area of hairy growth progression in the topical tofacitinib treated group compared to that in minoxidil treated group and control since day 7 until the experimental endpoint. According to our histopathological data, we demonstrated that hairs, most hairs in tofacitinib treated tissue seem to classified in late anagen as you could see from figure A, uh, while in minoxidil treated group uh, from figure B uh, demonstrated some catagen and anagen hairs, while in control also uh, classified in catagen, anagen, and some telogen, as you could see from figure C and D. And also we observed the skin darkening after the treatment of tofacitinib, which uh, this imply that tofacitinib could accelerate transition to anagen phase in even greater magnitude than minoxidil. And moreover, we demonstrated less inflammatory cells infiltration in tofacitinib treated tissue, as you can see from figure A, and compared to some inflammatory cells infiltration, especially in mononuclear cells, in minoxidil and control which they suggested that the anti-inflammatory property of tofacitinib might possibly promote hair growth by inhibiting hair follicle microinflammation, which is one of the pathogenic factors of AGA. And in addition, we found more newly formed capillaries in tofacitinib treated tissue in figure A compared to some slightly dilated completely formed capillaries in minoxidil treated group as you could see from figure B. Uh, while in control, see just only some uh, completely formed capillaries in DMSO treated group in figure C which this imply the angiogenic process according to tofacitinib treated group and according to anagen maintaining factors, we uh, demonstrated that the relative expression of VHF mRNA found to be the highest in tofacitinib trait group compared to others. Corresponding with the mean VHF concentration also found that uh, to be the highest in tofacitinib treated group compared to others. But IGF-1 and other anagen maintaining factors seem to behave in another way. We found that the relative expression of IGF-1 mRNA was highest in minoxidil treated group. Hence, tofacitinib treatment revealed higher in VHF expression level as compared to that of minoxidil and control. And also, we found newly formed capillaries that were increased in tofacitinib treated group. Uh, which suggested that the potential mechanism in leading to hair growth according to tofacitinib treatment might be VHF expression, which uh, acts as an autocrine growth factor and also increase in angiogenesis. Despite, IGF-1 might be less relevant to hair growth according to tofacitinib treatment. In conclusion, our study have raised another crucial therapeutic alternative apart from immune-driven conditions but by proving that tofacitinib is effective as a growth promoter with even higher efficacy than minoxidil. And also suggested that overexpression of VHF induced by tofacitinib might be another potential mechanism in leading to hair growth. And also its anti-inflammatory property might be additional prospective in hair growth promotion. For any question or more information, you can contact me at the poster session on Saturday. Short introducing the others, Dr. Jitlada, the corresponding author, Dr. Jindapa, which is me, Dr. Soran Yu, Dr. Wereyu, Dr. Raksawan, and Dr. Poon Kiet. We are all cooperated in this study. And lastly, I would like to introduce my small but strengthful dermatology department, Julapur International College of Medicine, Thammasat University, Thailand. We are the first postgraduated international a dermatology course in Thailand and we are just uh, running up to our fourth years but we have contracted MOU with many top abroad universities. Finally, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jindapa. Uh, we don't have time for questions so we'll move on to the final abstract. Uh, Bridget? Sa Sally? 
talk about LPP, lichen planopilaris, is another inflammatory uh, disease uh, with hair loss. And I'm interested to find out if jack inhibitors help. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you so much for having me today. I'm going to talk about the efficacy of oral tofacitinib in our patients that we treated with lichen planum pilaris. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. First, a little bit about lichen planum pilaris. It's considered the follicular variant of lichen planus. It's an inflammatory skin condition of the skin and mucous membranes. Um, there are three primary types of lichen planum pilaris, the classic form of lichen planum Planopilaris LPP, the frontal fibrosing alopecia, and Graham-Little syndrome. This is considered an auto-inflammatory um, skin disease and scalp disease. Um, it is characterized by irreversible destruction of the hair follicle um, near the bulge stem cell region and subsequent, subsequent permanent scarring of the scalp. So the clinical presentation of LPP is characterized by hair loss, pruritus, tenderness and burning um, that all the patients experience. Some of the clinical signs you'll see on exam are perifollicular erythema, follicular hyperkeratosis, scaling, and loss of the follicular osteo on examination of the scalp. So like I mentioned, there's a couple different types of lichen planopilaris. Um, the first, the classic LPP, is characterized by erythema, as you can see in the picture. This is the patchy type. There's shiny plaques and then the scarring hair loss, which characterizes the permanent hair loss in these patients. On the right is frontal fibrosing alopecia, the next most prevalent form of LPP. It's characterized by this band-like distribution of alopecia in the front of the scalp. Um, there's a few hairs that remain in front of the backwardly progressing hairline, and these are called um, the lonely hairs, lonely hair sign that um, characterizes frontal fibrosing alopecia, or FFA. Finally, um, as I mentioned before, there is Graham-Little syndrome, which can co-occur in LPP or FFA. This is thought to be a more severe form of the disease. It's characterized by cicatricial alopecia of the scalp, as well as non-cicatricial alopecia of the rest of the body, um, most prominently the axilla and groin. Also um, characterized by widespread um, lichenoid follicular papules all over the body. The epidemiology of primary cicatricial alopecias is, um, as seen on the right, um, they're, like in Plano Pilaris, accounts for about 40% of primary cicatricial alopecias. It has a four to one female predominance and it can onset anywhere from about 30 years of age to 60 with the age range a bit larger. There's a little bit of debate in the literature whether uh, about the incidence rate of LPP. It can be anywhere, or it's reported anywhere from one to 8%. Um, most importantly, it appears that all forms of primary cicatricial alopecia are on the rise. So LPP is characterized by the band-like infiltrate, um, lymphocytic infiltrate around the isthmus or the um, stem cell bulge region of the hair follicle. It spares the lower portion of the hair follicle, um, and this characterizes it and differentiates it from um, AA, where the, all the inflammation is at the bottom near the dermal papillae. So some of the histopathology from the LPP patients in our study, um, you can see the increased cellular infiltrate and fibrotic changes in the lesional skin on the top panels. Um, also the increased MHC class one and MHC class two expression in the lesional hair follicles, as well as in increased CD4 and CD8 um, cells around the mid hair follicle. Um, this is the bulge region. Current treatments for LPP are pretty non-selective. Um, they include immunosuppressants and corticosteroids, topical, interlesional, and systemic, as well as other immune suppressants like cyclosporin or mycophenolate moptil. Some of the most other common treatments are hydroxychloroquine and doxycycline. Um, and a wide range of other treatments have been tried as well, like eczema laser and oral retinoids, um, none of which have great efficacy or are um, tolerated well by patients. So in our other previous gene expression studies um, reveal inflammatory pathway and cholesterol metabolism pathway changes. In particular, the JAK-SAT pathway and immune pathways show dysregulation. Um, the CD8 T cells um, as well as the CD4 cells have been shown to attack the bulge region um, around where the stem cells of the hair follicle live. Um, the JAK inhibitor trials, as you've seen, um, have been ongoing in many different dermatological diseases um, in dermatology in the past year, so this is very exciting and targeting all kinds of um, different JAK-STAT pathways. 
um, our work and others, particularly in alopecia areata, has shown um, great efficacy in treatment, and the histologic Im and immunologic infiltration data led us to postulate that JAK inhibitor treatment would be effective in LPP and other lymphocytic cicatricial alopecias. So this is a pathway analysis of the RNA seq we performed on LPP lesional skin versus control skin, um, and it revealed several different pathways, uh, candidate pathways to target for immune therapy, um, also um, cholesterol metabolism pathways, but most importantly, we're going to concentrate on the immune pathways. Um, many of these pathways are, have JAK stat signaling dysregulation, and this um, led us to postulate the JAK inhibitor um, efficacy in LPB. So tofacitinib, as we've discussed, is a pan-JAK inhibitor. It's FDA approved for RA and psoriatic arthritis and is used off-label very commonly in ulcerative colitis and alopecia areata. It comes in the 5 milligram form, um, twice a day oral dosing, as well as the 11 milligram XR. So in our open label treatment, uh, or open label clinical trial, um, we treated 10 patients with LPP, four were male, six female. Um, eight had LPP to FFA, they ranged from 33 years of age to 68 years of age. The duration of disease was one to 15 years. Um, the dosage regimen was, five, they were started out on five milligrams twice a day orally, and then two patients that were not responding well um, were increased to um, five milligrams three times a day and achieved re good response. We monitored them monthly in office as well as with lab um, monitoring. And now they've had more than two years of clinical follow-up um, for some of these patients in our cohort with good success. So we used the LPP activity index to quantify their clinical response to um, tofacitinib. So as you can see, they achieved a good clinical response. Um, there were only two patients that did not see any change in their disease after um, tofacitinib treatment. These two patients were not elevated to the 15 milligram daily dose, um, and they were both like in Plano Pilaris patients. Um, everybody else achieved a very good clinical response with over um, about 44% of decrease in activity. Um, so we think that maybe the two patients that did not respond in this cohort would have responded um, at a 15 milligram dose, but they chose not to pursue that. So you can see some pictures um, from our patient cohort. On the left is this patient's baseline um, picture with prominent erythema and follicular hyperkeratosis. This is a 33-year-old man that had, had disease of duration, um, duration of disease for one year. Um, he was on 10 milligrams daily for 16 months. The middle panel, um, you can see he has good response to the tofacitinib with reduced erythema. And on the right, this is after two months of stopping his tofacitinib. He was treated for um, 16 months on it, but then was no longer able to get the drug. So he flared back um, with an increase in his LPPAI score as well. Um, these are two more patients from our cohort. On the left, a lady with FFA. You can see the prominent uh, erythema and follicular hyperkeratosis. On the right, you can see she's doing much better. Um, more hair is seen, as well as reduced erythema um, on the 10 milligram dose. On the right, you can see a patient with very severe LPP and a lot of hair loss. Um, her LPP AI score is not particularly impressive, um, but as you can see on the right, there's a lot of ink decreased erythema and less um, follicular prominence. So in conclusion, tofacitinib shows efficacy in slowing the progression in hair loss and controlling symptoms in eight of our 10 LPP patients in this open label study. No adverse events were reported. We used RNA-seq of skin biopsies and immune cells, um, immunophenotyping and LPP to determine the molecular pathways and effective use of tofacitinib in these scarring alopecias. Um, JAK inhibitors definitely uh, present a promising new rationally selected treatment for scarring alopecia. Um, so these early proof of principle studies invite further clinical investigation of JAK inhibitors and LPP in larger placebo controlled setting. I would like to, these are my references, and I would like to invite you to um, visit all of my other fellow colleagues' talks um, from the Cristiano lab, and these are my acknowledgments. Um, I would like to say thank you to everybody in the lab. None of these studies would be possible without the entire team and our funding sources, including the NIH. Thank you. In the interest of time, we're going to move on. Uh, I have to say I, I can feel the excitement uh, dripping off of Paul over here uh, to see what he started over 20 years ago. Uh, and I would be too. So I hope 20 years from now I can
can say something even close to what, what you're seeing now. Uh, so Stu is the co-founder and chief scientific officer of Eclaris uh, to give us some concluding remarks. Thank you, John. Uh, thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, as John said, I, I am the chief scientific officer of Eclaris. Uh, also founded by Neil Walker, who is also a, uh, our CSO and uh, also a dermatologist. So it's particularly meaningful for us to be able to provide a grant uh, to SID and IID to put on such uh, you know, unbelievably you know, spectacular symposium. And I agree with John how the field has so grown <laughs> since, uh, since Paul and his cohorts uh, came up with, uh, with TOFA and the, uh, the early JAK inhibitors. Uh, Obviously, a thanks to all of the, the great presenters here. I know I'm particularly going to follow Jindaba's work, you know, for some personal interest uh, regarding uh, AGA and the, the JAK inhibitors. Uh, so I have admit to a selfish uh, interest in that. Uh, this, the scientific committee and education committees here are really the best uh, we've ever worked with. And, you know, a lot of people behind the scenes do stuff. Everybody shows up and, you know, we do have wonderful presentations of great uh, data and findings. And, People don't know how much work goes on behind the scenes, so I want to thank everyone, especially uh, Rebecca, uh, Becky Milnello, for uh, you know helping uh, get everything uh, up and running. Uh, I want to thank the presenters who came here from you know anywhere from 20-minute drives to 20-hour flights uh, to be here, and just want to say ho hopefully you know Claris will be able to welcome you to be the third uh, symposium on uh, on Jacks. I can't promise the shout out to Chris Farley at this time, but we'll see what I can do. Uh, and I guess I look forward to seeing everybody here at the uh, next SID in Chicago uh, next year. So thank you very much. <laughs>